It's been an early start to make the most of one day in Marlborough. Flight time from Auckland is a bit over an hour uh, with a spectacular cruise over the Marlborough Sound and sounds and breathtaking descent into the Wairau Valley which is at the moment it's just carpeted with red and gold leaf vines ha having a well-earned sleep I've got to say after uh, the, two the rigours of the 2021 vintage. Welcome to The Real Review, live from Marlborough. I'm Bob Campbell and today we're going to look at eight wines, uh, visit several wineries and, and talk to one or two winemakers. Stay with us and learn about Marlborough past, future and present. Maori referred to the Wairau Valley as Kea Puta Te Wairau, the place with a hole in the cloud. Uh, although grapevines were planted in Marlborough around a hundred years ago, or a little over a hundred years ago, the modern industry started in 1973 when Montana Wines, now Brancotta State, planted around 240 hectares here. Hot days and cool nights through the ripening season produce intense fruit flavours and help to retain good acidity levels. That, that gives Mulbers trademark punchy, tangy wines that jump out of the glass and assault the senses. I'm here at Arnsfield with Luke Cowley. When your parents bought the place originally, back in 98 did you say? Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, um, uh, they, they just bought it as a vineyard and, 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 and as a hillside vineyard predominantly. Yeah. Uh, which was, was pretty uh, out there in those, in those days. It really was. Um, we were lucky to have some advice from um, some uh, forward-thinking uh, experts in the in the area. What a lot of um, people with experience were with experience internationally were saying is that there is great potential in, in some of these Marlborough hillsides and and the and the clay soil that we're finding there, and. Um, and essentially mum and dad fell in love with the land and I mean all the rest <laughs> seemed less important to them um, but uh, there was enough uh, enough um, belief for them to go ahead with with what they were doing. And it was only after they bought it that they discovered the sort of historic significance of this yeah. place because it really has got an amazing story I mean we think of we think of the wine industry starting in 1973 I was there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's a uh, hundred years uh, before that before that, that, um, yeah. that a wily Scotsman came out here and and looked around and you know decided that this is a great spot for vines and where he was going to make his wine so yeah it's, it's interesting to think about that um, and in terms of uh, the history, it, I think with um, mum and dad buying, <laughs> buying this land and sort of inheriting some of that history, it, it fell into the right person's lap. Like mm. Dad is uh, someone who's very, into, um, he's very passionate about preserving, preserving the stories that are here and, and building on them and recognising our part in the bigger story rather than it being his story. So this is actually the original winery there, re, 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 rebuilt I guess you'd yeah. have to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, there's, there's been a huge amount of restoration work there. But, uh, it certainly looks the part, it looks Australian with those gum trees there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so actually the gum trees are an interesting part. So they were planted on the corners uh, when it was originally built. Um, but uh, these front ones are actually a second generation of gum tree, so that kind of gives you a sort of visual idea of wow. the age. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, he planted them to give it a bit of structure. We were actually really fortunate um, when we'd finished restoring it, we had David Hood's granddaughter arrive here who remembered uh, making wine in this outside area and um, was able to tell us about how she'd stomped grapes and and they'd moved the wine inside um, to, to uh, mainly for storage. Yeah. Wow. This is the real deal. Yeah. <laughs> Genuine <know>. cobwebs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're out. That's our security. Um, 
So we, uh, you note as you come in here, I mean, today it's pretty mild temperature, but um, if you come in here on a really frosty morning, it's, it's still like 10 degrees, or on the hottest summer mm -hmm. day, it's 10 degrees. Oh, that's it's good just stuff. such a, you can see why he did that. Um, I should stress that you're not currently using it to make yeah, wine. Yeah, no, no, we're not currently <laughs> using it to make wine. <laughs> We've just come from Arnsfield. Uh, we're we're now at Geeson's Claven Vineyard, uh, and uh, sitting in a couple of very comfortable wine barrels. With the I've got global brand uh, ambassador uh, Roscoe, who's who's travelling a bit, but quiet for you at the moment with the COVID. It's, absolutely, <laughs> I've gone from uh, 65 flights a year down to uh, one. <laughs> you look very relaxed, I must Very say. relaxed. Uh, the family are enjoying it. <laughs> now, Giesen are a, uh, is a, a, a wine, quite a large wine producer started by uh, by three brothers, uh, Alex, Theo and, and Marcel. Uh, and they started in Christchurch in a, in a relatively small way and uh, have become a bit of an empire now, really. It's, uh, uh, how many hectares of vineyard do you... We have uh, 284 hectares, Bob, um, 13 vineyards, and we have around 50 odd growers uh, here in Marlborough. And, 50 uh, growers? Yeah, exporting to around 35 different countries around the globe. Oh, gosh. Geeson bought this Claven vineyard. The Claven vineyard was established in 91 originally, and which makes it, by uh, Marlborough standards, a, a, a reasonably mature uh, vi vineyard, and they claim it's a it's it's the uh, was the first hillside vineyard in Marlborough. That's been disputed. So let's just say it's one of the first hillside vineyards in, in Marlborough. But that's certainly what well, the hill, hillside by increasing the elevation and exposure, it, it brings up the heat. Uh, there's a there's a formula that I can't remember exactly, but it's every every rise in ten degrees of of slope increases the Heat by yeah, you, you certainly get uh, in this vineyard. Uh, you get the heat sort of sitting down the pockets uh, during the growing season. So uh, heat comes down through the hills uh, and and pockets down. So we grow uh, some Syrah here, which is quite unusual for Marlborough, and uh, we're able to ripen it. We're also very uh, low yielding, so we're, you know, roughly down to a bottle per vine. Uh, and and uh, Arnsfield had just started pruning. Uh, have you got? The pruners on the way, or we have we have not for Claven quite yet, but some of our other blocks we are. So certainly uh, that's one of the big challenges with uh, labour. What we're seeing with labour and uh, with yeah. um, the uh, COVID situation at the moment, and uh, yeah, it's uh, something. Last year was okay, so we're just hoping. Uh, with, you know, vintage was good. Uh, we had um, we uh, managed to get a, a great crew through, which was a big worry for us, and uh, have done a fantastic job. So the wines and. Mm. Uh, uh, in tank and in barrels looking really good so the winemakers are happy uh, which is good. Now you're not travelling so much they might give you a set of pruning shears. Uh... I reckon golf clubs might be better. <laughs> <laughs> There's still plenty to do Bob we're getting very very good at zoom calls at the moment oh, so uh, yeah, yeah of so uh, yes it is a bit of a, a bit of a change and uh, you know what what we're seeing with uh, uh, the Sauvignon Blanc in particular a huge global demand and uh, it's been uh, it's been really interesting so we're just talking through um, you know, how we deal with the, the shortage this year. Okay, so this is our, our Gaia uh, crawler, and the idea behind this is that with the tracks, it's got less than a human uh, footprint compaction rate, and if we have tractors you know, riding up and down these rows over 20 plus years, we get a lot of compaction, and we want to loosen those soils up so uh, we can increase the microbiology. Uh, and today we're planting some uh, uh, seeds. Winter cover crop. Yep, so we're power howering. Uh, with a cedar on top and then we're rolling the seed into the ground and hopefully we get a good strike for uh, a nice crop come spring. What's what's in here? Is that is this you, you this plant? Is the, seed, yeah. the seeds, is it? Yeah, so I'll that's come your... around this way so I'm not. Yeah, so the seed goes in the top here. Once the uh, the power harrow does its work and cultivates, then the seed drops into these small tubes. Um, the crumbler on the back just breaks up any clods that uh, have, have brought themselves up and then the roller just settles those seeds into the ground. Oh, clever stuff. And and this little is a sealed cabin, that, so you've got a positive pressure in there to, so, to avoid breathing in any sprays if you use sprays. But your 
organic and biodynamic. So yeah, yep. we still we still want to keep those sprays out of the cab. Um, they they have positive pressure, and the guys obviously run their fans just to keep that pressure 100% positive. So yeah. Uh, we've come from the Geese and Claven vineyard and we are now at number one family um, Bajee. <laughs> <laughs> what does it feel, how does it, how does it feel, to, you, this is quite an intimate family company isn't it? I oh, mean yes. you and, and, and your brother and, and mum and dad, mm -hmm. um, what's, what's the, what, what, what got you into the, what drew you into it? I think initially I've, I've had a different, quite a different career actually. Um, doing uh, presenting work and then acting work and stuff like that and it wasn't actually until I moved to the UK and pretty, mu pretty much moved right away from that I actually started working for a distributor, wholesaler, retailer called Amethyst Drinks who happened to be our distributor now but it wasn't until stepping away from you know, the, my previous industry to, that I worked with and even doing a little bit of PR in this one that I really saw uh, now you know, feel pretty bad. I have to admit to go to to have gone away at the age that I did, you know, later in life, and gone. Oh yeah, pop is a pop is an all right way maker, I suppose. <laughs> now it wasn't until I was there that I got this full experience and complete exposure to the industry on the world stage, and we all know London is certainly a place to do that. Mm -hmm. They they get the best and the best of everything and the whole market. So it wasn't until working for them that I got to try, you know, um, French Accorta, Prosecco, Carver, Method Traditionnel from around the world, Grower Champagne, Big Champagne, that right. I actually appreciated and went, oh gosh, Papa's not just a good winemaker, he's actually a phenomenal winemaker, <laughs> you know, and truly, truly I did not, it wasn't until that moment that it hit me, that it was like, oh wow, this is embarrassing, gosh. <laughs> But coming home, uh, honestly, I, I couldn't, I couldn't say how uh, to say that I am so, feel so ridiculously proud and um, incredibly privileged to to essentially Remy and I to be the custodians and Lee, our winemaker with with Remy as well. Remy's um, junior winemaker and vineyard manager, and Lee too with um, being the winery manager and, and and winemaker as well with Puffer in the background. We are so incredibly proud and fortunate. Mm. To sounds be in like, the sounds like a bit of a bubbly breakthrough. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Eureka moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's been oh, amazing. Great, but you, you, I mean, you really have bubbles in your blood because uh, it, you, the family association with, uh, with, with champagne goes back mm -hmm. to wh wh when is it? Uh, I believe the, the first case of a Lebrun being um, recorded as having grown uh, grapes in champagne was 1684. Oh. No pressure, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think we're pretty lucky. We're in good, we're in good hands. We have incredible mentors, ones that you could not ask for, for more. You couldn't ask for better mentors than Daniel and Adele. No, amazing. no, absolutely. Yeah, oh, it's God. pretty, it's pretty fantastic though. And you, and it was for Remy. It was the same. It was going to Champagne when, you know, he'd been one as a little, as a little one. But it was our grandfather while he was still around. Rene saying, you know, you need to essentially he told him he needed to come to Champagne and see where it was that he was from. And it was that moment for Remy that the penny dropped and he went, mm -hmm. I have to do this. This is us and it really did land for him and he's doing wonderfully well. I'm mm. very proud of him too. Mm. So that was bubbles in his blood, wasn't it? <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> it's fantastic, yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. How, how, how has Method Traditional fared with with the COVID business? Uh, if I'm really honest, really well. Oh, good. Really well. <laughs> I was and worried we do, there from you know <laughs> count our lucky stars, what have you. <laughs> um, it's it's been remarkable. The wonderful thing that I think has happened is that we as a country have really doubled down on on supporting one another. You know, our team of five million. We've I think we've taken that to a level where we've all embraced each other. Mm. We've been essentially parochial for one another, for the country. And so rather than getting champagne at Christmas, that kind of thing, people have invested in getting in, in getting method traditional from New Zealand or, or New Zealand products across the board. The gins, whatever you happen to be um, drinking and enjoying, we've really, it's, it's been really heartening, it's amazing. We've just come from number one family to uh, Astrolab. Uh, in fact, this is your uh, uh, cellar door, really, is it? Yeah, it's our offices, and we do host people here by appointment. Right, and I, I'm with Libby, who's been the general manager, Astrolab's general. It's a family 
company and there's, there's Dad Simon's the uh, the winemaker and uh, and and oh, your mum's still involved. She is. Yeah. She's, mum's still rattling around. <laughs> you you <laughs> she, elbowed her out. And she's, <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, I elbowed her out, but she's still yeah. She's in charge of our um, environmental and sustainability projects. Right. And 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 we're with the sister. And I'm always intrigued about the dynamics of 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 the. How long? You, when did you 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 were a lawyer in Brisbane? Yes. And you came back to be general manager of Astrolab. Yes. Was that a good move? Yes, I think it was a good move. <laughs> you know, we have our moments. I think every family business, but um, no, it's been going really well. I think we're all um, we're all really happy. And I, I don't think any of us would have expected, you know, even five years ago that um, I would ever be working back with the family business and Arabella, as well, which is is really cool. So my younger sister Arabella, who does our brand management and our marketing, she's um. I guess an artist by trade, so she went to Oh, art so she responsible for your new label, because <laughs> yeah. I love them. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. really do. I, I've just been writing about <laughs> about labels and how important they are and how neglected they sometimes can be, but I really like your new livery. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, we're pretty lucky because, yeah, she, she went off to um, Elam to fine art school, straight out of school, and then she's, she came home um, to do the marketing things here and I obviously went off to law school a lot more boring and did <laughs> lawyering um, but it's really cool to come back and there's a lot of us I think back in Marlborough um, who are sort of this kind of second generation now um, just with the age of the industry and, and the time um, that all of our parents were really getting into the industry so it's a it's a really nice thing to be involved in I think. right yeah now I've always I've always been a fan of Astrolab Sauvignon I'm a fan of your, your <laughs> complete range of wines I have to say but but Sauvignon's uh, is, is, is I think of Astrolab think of Sauvignon um, is that would I think that's still true I think we, we are happy to be known for Sauvignon because I think they can be sort of sometimes people a bit of a sniffy yeah, about it a yeah. bit of like a snobbery about Sauvignon but you know there's a reason why people love it and I think um, it's not just a one trick pony I think um, it's particularly with ours you know we have at least four tricks <laughs> we've got the, the Awateri and the Kikadegu more than that yeah, and the Taihawa Sauvignon so um, you know there's just such I think Dad's really, that's been a really big thing for him, is kind of championing that sub-regionality in, in Marlborough, and he's quite passionate about it. Like he was one of the, I guess, first to really um, dive deep into that Awateri style, and um, Kikaringu obviously has sort of been, um, well, it has been a really important part of our Pinot Noirs and Sauvignons and Chardonnays, but um, I think it's just, yeah, I think Sauvignon from Marlborough is just so classic now, you know, it's become such a big thing so quickly in the world of wine that we should be proud of it. We're, yeah, I we're agree. proud of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we love it. I know there's others producing Kekaringi wines, Kekaringu wines now, but but uh, but you've really you've really launched that whole sub sub region. <laughs> yeah, Dad's uh, really passionate about that that limestone through that Kekaringu region and how um, interesting that can be and how, what a contribution it can make um, to the wines that we make, even when it's quite a small parcel. Like even our main Marlborough Blend Sauvignon Blanc has a parcel of that Kekaringu fruit, and he thinks without it, it would be a real noticeable Oh, loss. that's the bridge, yeah. is it? Yeah, the, br the bridge Sauvignon we also have, which is kind of our Awateri and, yeah. and Kekaringu fruit, but we have two two growers down there, the, the Trollers and the Wilsons, and they their vineyards are really important for us. Yeah, we, we love that fruit. Mm, so mm. it's a big part of our kind of extra love story. I think. Mm. I'm going to taste eight wines and talk about their backstory, background, uh, their taste, uh, the real review points and score ranking, uh, and and the aging potential and uh, and food match for each for each wine. Uh, go to cellar cellar door door to door to order the wines. Uh, visit our website to see the scores and go to the link in the description of this video to to taste or track the wines along with me. The first wine we're going to, I'm going to taste is number one family estate Brut Rosé. Founder uh, Daniel Lebrun uh, began making wine in Champagne, or his family have been making wine in Champagne since 1684. 
Uh, and he, but he first planted vines in Marlborough in 1980. He's a method specialist, method traditional specialist, and uh, and the, um, uh, the, the 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 a member of the uh, the, the method Marlborough, which is a group of of, of fizz producers uh, that uh, only membership of the of method Marlborough, they're only allowed to use Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier, the three permitted varieties in, in Champagne. It's got to spend at least 18 months on the yeasty deposit and it does its second fermentation in the bottle. And, uh, and it's got to be Marlborough grown and bottled, of course. Um, this, uh, uh, this is 100% Pinot Noir and it's been 18 months on the yeast lees. It's a very pretty pale sort of pink orange, uh, deliciously ethereal when I last tried it. Let me have a look at it. Mm. Oh, there we go. I love that rich, creamy texture. It's classic Pinot Noir. Really, really not fruity. Uh, and it's got just a... Uh, a, a, an appealing yeastiness uh, and a background against a background of I guess I'd call it strawberry chocolate box and red rose petal um, are, the, are the characters that I get and that's they're supported by refreshing acidity that's a very impressive wine and a, tr a test for any really good method traditional is to is, is the texture and this has got a uh, an ethereal texture, which is a, which is uh, good stuff. It came number. It came first out of 22 non-vintage Pinot Noirs, uh, method traditionnel from New Zealand. And the food match that uh, uh, Daniel LeBrun recommends is. And as he says, it's a family favourite in the Bruin household, is a Dell's Cured Salmon Gravlax, and that is a classic, a classic match with, uh, with seriously good, uh, good fizz. Cheers. Now I'd like to feature 2019 Clos Marguerite Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, and uh, Marguerite is, is uh, from Belgium, the, the, and her grandfather was a was a wine wholesaler in Brussels. Her husband, Jean Charles, is a Frenchman, uh, and he studied in Bordeaux. He a soil scientist by qualification, I believe. Um, the, the, they've got a, just a ten hectare, which is quite a small vineyard uh, that they planted in 2000 in the Awatere Valley. Uh, with, they've only got Sauvignon Blanc and, plant, and Pinot Noir planted there, so they really are specialising in those two, those two varieties. The vineyard's close planted, uh, to give, which I think really gives the extra concentration, a feature of these wines. It's distinctive, they're distinctive and concentrated, and they age the Sauvignon on the yeast lees to give added textural appeal. Let's see what it tastes like. You know, it's got a, quite a concentrated Sauvignon Blanc with real our Terry character, sort of passion fruit, lime zest, green capsicum, uh, and and just that, that touch of oyster shell, minerally flavors that, that I, I particularly like. Uh, it's got a, just a, a, a suggestion of gingery yeast lees. Um, it, it, it's, it's quite a distinctive wine. It's quite a, 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 an individual character. I if I, I if it was in a lineup of say a dozen. Sauvignon Blancs, uh, and I knew it was there, I think I would pick it. Um, it's uh, a, a, a really a standout wine. It's one I chose to serve at my uh, youngest daughter's wedding, actually. Um, 
so that was a long time ago. Uh, and um, and it's got this lovely, this lovely balance of fruity acidity. It's a, it's a classic Arbutturi style, really delicious wine. At Real Review, I rated it 95 points, and it ranked number seven out of 16 Sauvignon Blanc from, uh, from the Awateri Valley. Uh, now, for, for food match, uh, Marguerite says, ouch, that is a tricky one. This wine is so versatile that there are a lot of perfect food matches. One I particularly love is Scallops Carpaccio with truffle salt and parsley. Um, that sounds pretty good to me. I think I'd uh, uh, happily join her for a meal of, of scallops if, uh, if I were ever invited. Cheers. Now I'm going to taste the 2020 Astrolab Awateri Valley Sauvignon Blanc. Astrolab is very much a family affair. Simon Waghorn is the winemaker. Jane Forest Wagon, uh, his wife, and uh, and two daughters, Libby and Arabella. For me, Sauvignon Blanc is the signature wine of, of Astrolab. Now that that's I, I, on shaky ground because they they make a, 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 an awful lot of very good wines, but for the, but my personal favourite is uh, is Sauvignon. Um, in addition to Sauvignon, they do Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, Riesling. Uh, Pinot Noir, they're mainstream varieties, and then the less well-known varieties like Alborino and Chenin Blanc. I'm a big fan of both. And, uh, and, and one thing that, that uh, Astrolab's contribution to, uh, to fine wine is, is really they have launched the Kekarengu uh, region, which is a, a coastal region about halfway between, between Blenheim and Kaikoura. Uh, and it's quite... Um, quite rich in, in, in limestone, so you get these really interesting minerally uh, characters coming through. Just, I think, uh, I've always had a, a soft spot for, for, uh, uh, for Astrolab Awateri Sauvignon Blanc, I have to confess, I find that very Sancerre-like, uh, but, uh, but uh, I have a, also a, a, a weakness for the Kekarengu uh, Sauvignon Blanc. But tonight, today we're featuring the, the Awateri, so let's not get too confused. Uh, and let's see if... Twenty twenty was a pretty cracker of a, very much a cracker of a vintage, so uh, I'm expecting good things. Well, I've tried it before and I've given it a good rating. I've been concentrated, rich wine. It's got a, a lovely textural feel, a, a, a sort of fleshiness that, a mouth filling uh, a character that I that I particularly like. Um, it's great acid, acid, a great line of acidity that that keep. I think that's responsibility for responsible for pushing the the uh, the, the flavour that so it lingers long after the wine has been spat or swallowed. Um, really sort of quite, quite green Awateri notes. We've got uh, a little bit of tomato leaf, green capsicum. Uh, not as green as normal. I think this is a pretty ripe vintage and, and so the, the, the pendulum swimming to, swinging to the riper end of the spectrum. In, in rating, I gave it 95 points, and that ranked number five out of 113 2020 Sauvignon Blancs from Marlborough, so that's uh, uh, right up the top there. Simon Waghorn, uh, when I asked him what uh, he would match with this wine, came up with some quite interesting response. Stuffed jalapenos, um, rocket and tomato salad. Anything fresh, green, and leafy. Um, green lip mussels, goat's cheese, tabuli, tabuli, fresh herbs, and peppery leaves. And they're all echo matches with the, 
the sort of characters that I expect to find in, in, in this wine. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that, Simon, and uh, well done. Now I'd like to talk about 2019 Novum Chardonnay. Owners William Hoare and Rachel Jackson Hoare uh, uh, are the force behind this wine. Um, they just make two wines, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, uh, although they're not, uh, they're quite likely to introduce, they're just a young firm, a young winery, and they're just, they're really going to introduce other varieties as they arise. So they're starting with, starting at the top, I'd say, with Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Uh, they use only corks, which is kind of interesting in this screw cap uh, dominated market. Um, and they source grapes from family vineyards and, and, and some from very special friends, they describe them as. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the best, f they aim to get the best fruit from a small pocket in a good vineyard. So they spend an awful lot of time prospecting for the right sort of. Uh, right sort of grape supply. Um, demand exceeds supply. I, I went on their uh, website uh, and uh, they were out of stock completely. So uh, I would suggest that if you wanted to taste any of their wines, you might have to join their mailing list and, and get a, a future vintage. Let's, let's try the wine. And before I do, I just should explain this gadget on top of the bottle is a is a Coravan, which is an ingenious American invention where um, it's got a, a cylinder of gas in the in the uh, handle here, and and we dr we drive a hypodermic needle through the cork and into the wine, um, into the bottle of wine, and then put a, an inert gas called of argon into the bottle under pressure and that forces wine up this fine hypodermic thing and back out this little spout. So let's see if we can make it work. This could end in tears. It takes a while to get to get the wine out of it, that's probably all we need. They're very popular in uh, high-end restaurants where you're able now to buy a, uh, a, a taste of, of an expensive wine that uh, would normally, normally you'd have to buy a bottle. But, uh, and the, the wonderful thing about them is they, the makers claim that you can now take the, the Coravan off the bottle, put the bottle back in your wine cellar and do the whole thing again in another year and it'll be, it'll be just as fresh as normal. So it fresh as it was never breached. Anyway, let's check this out. What an elegant sort of concentrated Chardonnay. I get peach, citrus, grapefruit, a little bit of hazelnut and, 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 and sort of perhaps baked bread flavours. Um, lovely fruity acidity that really, once again, helps drive a, a, a lengthy finish. It's got purity and power and good potential. So that's uh, uh, quite an alliteration there. Purity, power and good potential. Uh, lovely, lovely, a lovely wine, very impressive. I rated it uh, 95 points and uh, it was second out of 41 2019 Chardonnays from Marlborough, so that's uh, right at the top. I asked William to uh, come up with a, a food match and he said it's our favourite variety uh, to, to drink, so we pretty, well, pretty much drink it with all foods, but in general, Chardonnay matches well with seafoods such as scallops or light textured fish, chicken or even pork. Thanks, William, and thank you for the wine. Now we're moving to reds, uh, and we're going to start with 2019 Cloudy Bay Pinot Noir. Oh, I should say that 2019 was a great vintage in Marlborough, so that uh, uh, certainly certainly has an influence on the on the wine's quality. Um, Cloudy, Cloudy Bay are part of the LMVH group, that's Moet Hennessy Louis Vuitton, which has got such great names as Chateau Uchem, Krug, Dom Perignon, and a whole host of other other uh, 
names that most of us can only dream about, never taste. Um, so it really deals in luxury goods. It's a, it's, it's a, a good uh, company to be part of because they have very, very high standards and, uh, and uh, are no doubt a pool of, I'm only assuming here, but no doubt a, a pool of technical expertise that would be denied to, to, to most. Uh, Cloudy Bay was founded in 1985 by David Honan, a, a very resourceful visionary uh, uh, man from, from Western Australia, from Margaret River. They have expanded into, into central Otago, but still produce uh, a mightily good uh, Marlborough uh, Pinot Noir, uh, which, is, which I'm about to taste. So let me, let's uh, have a taste. I've always liked Cloudy Bay Pinot, Cloudy Bay's Marlborough Pinot. Um, but but in, in, 19, in 2019, it's, it seems to be richer and fruitier and more generous than usual. Um, normally you have to wait a little bit, a little bit, a few years to, to start to, for the wine to flesh out and fill out and, and, and deliver the, this sort of uh, really appealing intensity. But uh, to me, it's, 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 uh, it's there from day one. So where it's going to go is, uh, is an exciting uh, exciting thing to try and uh, try and imagine. It's um, I think it's a it's a delicious wine. Le le texturally, it really really works works for me. Uh, I scored at 95 points and it ranked number three out of 93 2019 Pinot Noirs from from Marlborough. Jim White, winemaker, recommends a rack of Taimana lamb with Jerusalem artichoke puree, which uh, sounds like a really good, uh, a good partnership. Cheers. Now we're going to feature 2015 Saracen Estate Sun and Moon Pinot Noir. The Saracen Estate was founded by acclaimed cinematographer Michael Saracen in the early 1990s and he had this vision of producing a, an Italianate type estate that's not just, right, not just monoculture, not just growing grapes, but with olive trees and, uh, and, and fruit orchards and, and vegetables and things like that, a real, a real diverse, uh, diverse range of, 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 of products. Um, they're biodynamic, they have been from uh, very early on, biodynamic and organic, uh, been, they've been for some, for some time. Uh, they produce um, uh, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, Riesling, Pinot Gris and Pinot Noir. Uh, they have, by my count, if I've got it right, um, seven different Pinot Noir labels and Sun and Moon is, is the absolute flagship. Uh, and it uh, uh, justifies its, uh, its flagship status, in, in my view. Let me try it. Got the benefit of a bit of bottle age, 2015. <clears throat> Quite a rich, mellow uh, Pinot Noir, really moving into the, the prime of its life. It's, uh, it's got lovely little sort of savoury, nutty layers um, with, uh, with uh, cherry, plum. Um, I, I'm getting little dried herb notes too. It's just an ever-changing kaleidoscope. It's a, a, a delicious wine. Um, it's it's really mellow and and uh, 
it just holds my interest. Not, not a wine to not a wine to quaff, a wine to meditate over. Um, it's a, a, a super a super wine. In terms of ranking, I gave it 95 points, and it rated 16th out of 138. 2015 Pinot Noirs from Marlborough. Uh, when I asked what um, food match to uh, recommend, they said uh, seared venison loin served with porcini or Swiss brown mushrooms, or for a vegetarian option, a rich por porcini risotto, which, uh, uh, which uh, sounds jolly good to me. Cheers. Now I'd like to feature 2019 Arnsfield Single Vineyard Pinot Noir. Well, Arnsfield is a, an ambitious, uh, medium-sized uh, wine producer. Founded in, it was originally founded in 1873 by, by David Hurd, um, Marlborough's founding winemaker. Uh, my, I'm, a, I'm a herd on my mother's side, so I could even be related to him. Um, the original rammed earth wine cellar has been restored, and other buildings on the property have have uh, have been have been uh, uh, re reinstated. So, so it's a it's a fascinating fascinating uh, winery to to visit. Um, it's in the southern valleys, and it, and it it was it purchased. The land was purchased for for. Uh, for for vine vineyards well before there were any other vineyards in the area, so it was it was uh, uh, t t t taking a bit of a, ch a chance there, but relying on expert opinion, which uh, certainly proved to be to be right. Uh, it's a 65 hectare vineyard, but they don't uh, produce all the wine under their own label. They sell some of their grapes. Uh, I, m I would imagine they keep the cream of the crop for themselves. Um, they make Sauvignon, Chardonnay, and Pinot Noir, so they just stick to the knitting and uh, and uh, do it uh, really well. I I find Arnsfield very honest wines with with uh, that, that are sort of seem to be made with integrity. They're not not, not wines that that uh, are being pushed or forced something into into a, a sh shape that they uh, don't naturally uh, uh, fit. Anyway, let's uh, let's see how this shapes up. Good colour, plenty of colour. Winemaker uh, Luke Cowley uh, says that he, he he can't really talk about aiming at a certain wine styles that the the wine styles make themselves. You know, he just grows as healthier grapes as he possibly can and makes wine out of them and this is this is the result intensely intensely fruity uh, fruity wine with a with a sort of plum cherry berry flavors quite quite amplified fruit flavors but there's a behind that there's a a real savoriness a savory um, uh, herby uh, character that really, really sets off the fruit flavours. It just, it's certainly not a one-dimensional wine. It's a multi-dimensional wine. Um, absolutely delicious, lovely texture, um, rich, smooth, just uh, seductive Pinot Noir. I think it's uh, c certainly very approachable now, and it's quite a young wine, but uh, uh, it, it will age well with that with that sort of. Um, weight and intensity behind it. Um, I rated it 95 points and at number two out of, out of uh, 95 2019 Pinot Noirs from Marlborough, which is a, a, pretty, good, uh, a pretty good ranking. Uh, winemaker Luke Cowley uh, recommends a food match of char-grilled steak, lamb, venison, and rustic dishes with cassoulet or duck with olives. So he's got the all bases covered there. But uh, but uh, I must say I concur with his selection. Cheers. 
And now we're going to taste 2016 Geese and Claven Pinot Noir. Claven is, is, is probably one of the best known uh, vineyards in Marlborough. It's, uh, it, it was planted in 1991 uh, and, um, and is the first or possibly the second uh, hillside vineyard in, in, in the region. Uh, it's in a lovely uh, sloping, north-facing uh, slope, quite steep at the top, and then, it, and then it levels out. Reminded me in some ways of the sort of lower reaches of Burgundy. Um, high density planting, and, uh, and it's, uh, Giesen uh, uh, was founded by three brothers, uh, Theo, Alex, and Marcel, uh, and they have proved to be very, very successful with high volume Sauvignon Blanc. Um, so they've, they've made it with a quantity and they're now showing the world that they can produce extremely high quality wine because that's what this wine is and that's what the Claven Vineyard is all about. Uh, they've invested heavily in premium vineyards with, with just an eye to the top end and I think at the top end and at the, at the lower end, uh, Giesen really seems to, to over, over deliver. Let's try the wine, a great big heavy bottle. Plenty of colour, a little bit of bottle age, but not showing in the colour. It's still uh, very vibrant and ruby. Oh, a lovely, a lovely aroma. I always think that's a, it gets me off to a good start with a Pinot when it really jumps out of the glass and, and, and says, I am Pinot in a very emphatic way, which this does. Ah, texturally, it's brilliant. Absolutely, absolutely wonderful. I could... Oh, it's just lovely. Really, uh, really impressive wine. It's an elegant, supple Pinot Noir with cherry berry, violet, dried herb, and, and I get spiced oak. Yeah, spiced oak, spicy oak flavours. Yeah, seductively smooth texture, an impressively lengthy finish that reve reveals uh, a wine of subtle power. Uh, so it's a really, really got, got finesse. I rated it 95 points, which got it scored at number six out of 142 2016 Pinot Noirs from Marlborough. What to match with this? Duck confit is the answer, uh, and that's a classic Pinot match, and this is a classic Pinot, so I can see that going to down together very well. Cheers.